Hi, folks, come in. Uh, seats in the front are going for $1,000 each, so uh, grab the seats while they last. So my apologies, the session was originally Information is Beautiful, Zeppelin, but I did that talk a couple of months ago, and I was trying to do something different. And also based on the fact that a lot of people are asking this question, so I thought maybe telling people why Zeppelin is beautiful and what they can do with it, I thought let me answer a more practical question that a lot of people are struggling with it. So I changed the title uh, and the talk subject uh, about two weeks ago, so that's why it wasn't reflected in, the, in your uh, agenda that was printed out, but it's reflected on the website. So my apologies if you're confused. If you're looking really for that session, that information is beautiful, I uh, can give you a link to that. It was at previous DataWorks in Munich, so if you go to that DataWorks website and look for the Munich event, you can find that session, slides, and video both. So you don't have to choose one or the other, you have access to the both. So let's talk about uh, Zeppelin and running Zeppelin in production. So as form of introduction, uh, I've been a programmer and product management, I can't decide which one I like best. One of these days, uh, I'll figure it out. But for now, I've been doing both things and I love both. I've been uh, at Hortonworks for almost four years and I've done a lot of Hadoop, Spark, et cetera. So why do we care about Zeppelin? So how many of us here have actually used Zeppelin? A lot of people, but not everyone. Okay. So uh, Zeppelin, because not everyone raised their hand, is a notebook-based interface. A challenge with big data for most people who are not programmers is that there are a lot of command line and you have to deal with Kerberos, you have to jump on command lines, you have to deal with arcane commands, and that limits the adoption of big data. And again, data is about processing and gaining insights from it. Like, I hear every, everywhere people saying that in, data is uh, doubling every year. Those types of stats are meaningless to me. I want information to double everywhere, uh, every year or every whatever period and not even information, I want insights to double. Wouldn't that be nice? And I don't think we are making progress on that path. So Zeppelin gives you a visual way to get more people access to the data, so hopefully they can at least get information out of it, and whether we get insight or not, that may be too philosophical uh, question, so I won't go there. So Zeppelin is a notebook-based interface. It allows uh, somebody to just go to a browser, not have to deal with Kerberos. They can just log into Zeppelin using their corporate LDAP user ID and password, so it becomes very familiar. You can jump to Zeppelin, and Zeppelin can connect to the various different backends. In Zeppelin, Zeppelin's lingo, each backend connection is called an interpreter. So Zeppelin supports about 30 different interpreters. You can choose uh, one to many of them. You can choose many of them in a single notebook or note as well. So uh, Zeppelin, uh, for most of us, or a very common use of Zeppelin is uh, dealing with Spark. So Zeppelin supports Spark interpreter built in. Levy is also an interpreter that supports Spark connection, and there are reasons why I prefer Levy uh, over uh, Spark, and I will tell you uh, why. Uh, I'll share those reasons with you. So Zeppelin also has built-in visualization, so it supports built-in six chart type, and uh, those are the most common chart type, like bar, pie chart, et cetera. And if you wanna have more additional charts, uh, you can add them provided you know a little bit of JavaScript. And again, a lot more of that uh, detail I'm not gonna cover on extending visualization. I'll refer to my previous talk on that. So how does Zeppelin work? For a user of Zeppelin, it, you're just, uh, accessing a notebook. From the notebook, you can uh, uh, you launch the notebook in a browser, you go to a Zeppelin website, and Zeppelin will connect to wherever your cluster is set up. So the user only sees Zeppelin UI. In terms of the Zeppelin architecture, uh, it's the client is the software that is running on user's browser, so it's JavaScript. The client is JavaScript running inside somebody's browser. The server refers to Zeppelin server, and each of those interpreter which represent connection to a given backend are represented by interpreters. Interpreters can be clubbed together in interpreter group, and we will uh, see where that, uh, why that is significant and where that comes in, in play. 
one thing I would like to point out is typically, so if you l go to the machine where Zeppelin is running, and if you do PS, if you do what process, see what processes are, are running, you'll see server is one process, interpreter would be a separate process. So for each backend connection uh, there, uh, at least each interpreter, there will be a separate process running. An implication of that could be maybe that process is killed. I don't know, you can, somebody can do a PS minus uh, kill or something like that, or you can kill a process that way. But keep that in mind, the process interpreter lifecycle is different from the lifecycle of the Zeppelin server. So continuing a little more detail on uh, Zeppelin, the basic unit of work in Zeppelin is called a note. A note is, think of it as your notebook page, and within your note are paragraphs. And you write a bit, bit of code in the paragraph, you hit play button in the paragraph, the code is sent to the back end, the code is executed, and the results are pulled back, and the browser uh, then displays those results. And I'll give you a quick walkthrough of that as well. Uh, I'll do a quick demo of that as well. So that's the note and the paragraph and the relationship with, with that. In, when it comes to interpreter, interpreter can run in various modes, shared, isolated, and scoped. And the name is pretty uh, reasonable description of what the interpreter modes mean. So shared mode means all of the interpreters uh, or a given instance of interpreter is available to everyone who's connected to that Zeppelin server. And so that's a mode where there is no isolation. And that means it might be efficient in terms of process uh, resource utilization, but will not, it may not be what you actually want. Versus at the other extreme is, if you wanna give each user their own interpreter, then you can have isolated mode, which is uh, the other extreme uh, configuration. And somewhere in between is scoped mode, where the interpreters are still uh, running the same uh, uh, interpreter group. And it's possible to share uh, interpreters um, uh, or objects among the interpreters in the scoped mode. So that's uh, there. But this is mostly, uh, with that context, the talk is about running Zeppelin in production. So what are those concerns about running Zeppelin in production? The first thing is, where do you deploy Zeppelin? Hadoop has master node, worker nodes, edge nodes, all that. So that's, uh, we'll talk here. Other uh, concerns about deploying Zeppelin in production is, how do I hook it up to the security? What is the sizing? What is the resource utilization? Where does the log go? Where do I, how do I monitor it? How do I upgrade it? When things go wrong, what are the common things that can go wrong? So those are some of the things I'll try, or I'll try to address all of them. And uh, if something uh, I don't have in the slide, at the end of the slide, you can ask me a question. And before I get too further out, like, uh, or before I actually forget, if uh, at the end of the session, if you can rate this session, give uh, organization, uh, organize, organizers some feedback, so if they invite me next year, it'll be because of you. So, uh, in terms of deploying Zeppelin, you already know there are a lot of choices. The best place to deploy Zeppelin is uh, the client or the gateway node, and why. So my goal is, for any recommendation, you need to understand why, otherwise recommendation is just meaningless. So, gateway node is accessible both to the outside and the inside of the cluster. So that's the common play point to deploy. And that's why a lot of Hadoop libraries are or client libraries are deployed on the gateway node, and Zeppelin is no different. So here is an example of uh, a typical Zeppelin deployment in a corporate environment. You have Zeppelin deployed. You have connected Zeppelin to your corporate Active Directory or LDAP. So that's uh, step number two. Zeppelin supports SSL. You can uh, connect Zepp a browser and represented here by John Doe. So John Doe logs to their uh, desktop or laptop, they launch a browser, they go to Zeppelin website over SSL, and that's uh, the connection number one. Uh, Zeppelin takes the John Doe user ID and password, Zeppelin will go authenticate the user, that's step number two. And once that step is successful, Zeppelin will allow them to write notes, paragraphs that can execute against Hive or Spark, Etc. So that's sort of overall how it works. 
Now, because primarily Zeppelin is used with Spark. I mean, Zeppelin can be used with other things like Hive, Phoenix, uh, Flink. Uh, but the mo most common use case for Zeppelin is with Spark. So I want to touch upon uh, how do you interact with Spark. It's a little tangential, but I don't think it's going too far out. So there are a lot of different ways where you interact with Spark. So for example, if you're running Spark on Yarn, so, uh, and when I said Spark on Yarn, I'm referring to the Spark's uh, uh, sort of how Spark runs in a cluster. There are four ways in Spark can run in a cluster. Spark standalone, Spark pseudo mode, Spark on Yarn, or Spark on Mesos. Uh, my focus is uh, Spark on Yarn because that's what I've been working on. Uh, that's what Hortonworks supports. So uh, Spark on Yarn is where Spark is leveraging Yarn to provide cluster manager and resource manager uh, facilities. So there are various ways to interact with uh, Spark on Yarn. If you're just starting out with Spark, you typically downloaded Spark, you're running on your laptop, you're running Spark standalone, and you're dealing with Spark primarily through the Spark REPL, which is the Spark shell here. Once you move on beyond that stage, perhaps you have deployed an app that calls Spark, and maybe you're interacting with, let's say you build a website on top of Spark. So prime, it's possible then you could be calling Spark through uh, the REST API, and in that case, uh, Livy is an example. Uh, Livy is a REST API that invokes Spark jobs, so you can put Livy on the same remote or gateway node uh, and have some website outside of your Hadoop cluster or your big data environment interact with Spark. Another way of interacting with Spark is some BI tool. So people may have developed like Tableau or other BI tool, and they could be interacting with Spark through that BI tool. So it's basic, uh, very old technology like JDBC, ODBC connection coming into Spark, and that connection comes through the Spark Thrift server at the top. Then, uh, Zeppelin is another interaction. As I mentioned, Zeppelin supports uh, Spark <coughs> interpreter, and that is the direct connection between Zeppelin and Spark on Yarn there. That's the direct line. But Zeppelin can also connect to Spark via Livy, and that is the indirect path that, uh, that I've shown there. And in each of those boxes, the tiny orange dot represents the Spark driver. And if you know Spark well, you know Spark driver is, represents, your, represents your connection to the Spark cluster, it's where the Spark DAG is comp uh, compiled, it's where uh, Spark program launches. So if you create a Spark context, that the place where you create Spark context is your Spark driver. So that was, uh, that gives you how different ways, uh, how many different ways you can interact with Spark. Because now let's, with that context, let's jump into how Zeppelin interacts with Spark and especially with security and, uh, and we can jump into uh, Livy's indirection as well. So as I mentioned, Zeppelin supports uh, SSL. Zeppelin, uh, so a common requirement is people wanna have Zeppelin be fronted by a load balancer. So for example, uh, it could be that on a given Zeppelin instance, you have set up 10, 15 users. Don't put 100 users on a given Zeppelin instance, but you can put up to 10, 15 users on a given Zeppelin instance, and you have 10 other users. So you can stand up another Zeppelin server in your cluster. So if you have multiple Zeppelin servers, you may want to load balance user requests across them, and you can put a load balancer in front of them. So that's one reason why you may want to have a load balancer in front of Zeppelin. So in that case, perhaps you're terminating the SSL connection at the load balancer, especially if it is all in the same uh, DMZ. Or if you're not using load balancer, you may still wanna use SSL, and in that case, Zeppelin supports SSL, and uh, you can connect, terminate the SSL connection at the Zeppelin instance. And again, Zeppelin supports LDAP and uh, Spark connection. So how does security in Zeppelin work? So uh, Zeppelin leverages an Apache project called Shiro. So Zeppelin's uh, uh, security is primarily dependent on Shiro, and it's dependent for both authentication and authorization. So here is an example Shiro configuration. Uh, the Shiro configuration is divided among different sections. A section defines uh, 
the, the main section defines the LDAP connection. So it, in that section, you define the detailed coordinates of your LDAP server or Active Directory server. Temporary, if you're uh, using Zeppelin for the first time, uh, and you may want to use uh, a local definition of users and group not connect to LDAP, you can define your uh, users and group in that case in the main section or users section. Uh, so the, sorry, uh, the user section defines the users if you are locally defining users there. And then URLs is URL-based uh, security patterns. So you can define like forward slash, this is my URL pattern. That's the group that should have access to that. So you can define that in the URL section. Here is, uh, uh, so you can edit this uh, shiro.ini if you don't have Ambari manually through your notepad or whatever your text editor. But if you have Ambari in your cluster, use Ambari to edit uh, Shiro and manage that configuration. So in this slide, I showed you uh, a couple of uh, examples of LDAP configuration. So there are two different LDAP authentication mode. One is LDAP bind, and the other is LDAP search or compare. So a lot of people uh, who are LDAP wonks, they know these terms inside and out, but I wanna explain that. So when you type in your username and password and log into any website, there are two different ways in which you can be authenticated through LDAP. One is the website will take your username and password and directly pass to the, web, uh, to the LDAP server. And, in that, and if it gets success, uh, successful authentication back from LDAP using your username and password, that's called LDAP bind. In that case, the username and password is sent to the LDAP. The other, uh, and so there are advantages and ad disadvantages of both of these approach and one, some organization prefer one approach, the other organizations prefer the second approach. The second approach is uh, the LDAP authentication is not done on the username and password that somebody typed in. There is already a, a existing connection to the LDAP and that connection is made, made using a system account and on that system account, a search is made on the LDAP based on the provided information credentials. And if that search is successful, then authentication is uh, deemed to be made. So that is the LDAP search. I've shown authentication parameters for both different ways. So the slides are available. You can go into uh, details. Actually, the slides are already published. You'll see the link on the last slide. So, uh, so if you wanna follow more details, uh, there is a blog out that goes into all these details, covers that. I've linked the blog here. So I'm, I'm not gonna spend time on each of these parameters here, but you can find a lot of details there. So when you want to connect to LDAP, typically you want to, uh, LDAP connection is uh, sensitive because you are sending username and password over that. So you should have SSL over that connection so there could not be any eavesdropping in that. So in that case, you want to have LDAP connection. A very common error I've seen Somebody says, I have enabled LDAP connection over SSL, and now Zeppelin doesn't work. Typically, LDAP doesn't have a, a well-known CA certificate. So often people have self-signed certificate, so it's just that the process running Zeppelin, which is a JVM process, does not trust the certificate that is issued to the LDAP. So in that case, you will have to do the import, import the certificate. So I've shown the steps to import the certificate there. If you, your LDAP is using a well-known certificate that you have paid for to a well-known CA like uh, VeriSign, et cetera, you won't have to do the step two there. But if you are using self-signed certificate, you will have to do that step. Another issue is if you have LDAP connection uh, uh, and you're using either, uh, you're providing the password to the LDAP connection, often because shiro.ini is a text file, the fi you don't want to just leave your password in that text file. And the worry there is you don't want to share that LDAP password with your admin or whoever is looking at that file. So in that case, you want to uh, leverage Hadoop credential uh, facility. So Hadoop credential is, think of it as a wallet. You can in create an entry in the Hadoop credential uh, and you can, typically you provide the alias to that entry and in that uh, the, ref the value of that ent entry or the alias would be the password and Hadoop credential will store that password in JCEKS form format, which is a stronger format of JKS uh, format. So you can store the uh, format, uh, the password in that Hadoop credential 
Then on the Zeppelin side, in the Zeppelin configuration, instead of specifying the password directly, you can say, I'm using Hadoop credential, and here is my alias that I've defined in the Hadoop credential. So that's the example there. Uh, in the step one, uh, you're using, using Hadoop credential create command to create an entry. You say what is your alias name. The first line there, LDAP realm .context factory system password. that's the alias. And then you're saying, where is the file stored? Then you type in the password. Then in the last line on this slide, uh, in the shiro.ini, you're referencing the, uh, the alias, and instead of providing the password in line there, you're providing the reference to the path of the credential store that you provided in uh, step one. One advice there is because you went to the trouble of uh, putting the password in the credential store, it means you're concerned about that password and the safety of that. And a layer of, of protection there is to not share, do not open that file, do not share that file too permissively with other people. So have a restrictive file permission. Uh, so have 400 or something like that. So don't share the file too permissively with others. Similarly, uh, so that was what I just talked about was for password for JDBC. Uh, or rather LDAP. Uh, if you're using Zeppelin to connect to a JDBC, and in this case, I'm not talking about Hive JDBC connection, but let's say you're using another SQL compliant database, for example, MySQL, or you're using some other SQL uh, database and Zeppelin is connecting to that. If you want to avoid storing the password again for that connection in clear, you can use the similar mechanism. Just create an, another alias in the same credential store and refer to that. Uh, there. And the reason why I mentioned uh, this is not needed for Hive is because in Hive we have implemented what's called Hadoop credential uh, support or do as support. So the identity of logged in user is propagated to Zeppelin. So there is no need to provide password based authentication. But other systems like MySQL don't support that facility. So you don't have to worry about this problem with Hive. So that brings up to the identity propagation. So uh, what is identity propagation? If you remember the slide where I showed about the deployment uh, of Hadoop and how, uh, or deployment of Zeppelin and how Zeppelin works, there is the browser, there is Zeppelin server, there is the interpreter, and then the connections on the back end, executor, Spark, Yarn, if, or Hive. So in that case, you logged in on the left side to Zeppelin UI as John Doe. The job needs to run as John Doe all the way in the back end. And that's basically identity propagation, the job running all the way down as John Doe. So to make that happen, we have to do some work. So Zeppelin, we had to integrate Zeppelin with Libby. And there are two reasons for integrating Zeppelin with Libby. One was Libby gave what's called session uh, support. So without session support, all you have is a Spark context. And Spark context represents your connection to the Spark cluster. But if you want to share that Spark context across, there was no easy way. In uh, Libby, there is an abstraction on top of Spark context. It's called Spark session that Libby has, uh, or uh, Libby session, rather. So that session represents uh, basically a Spark context. So you can share that Libby session among multiple users. And right now, that's and that was one potential uh, path, the facility why we started using Libby there. The other reason uh, for using Libby there was when we started on this path, the Spark interpreter did not support identity propagation, and we uh, needed identity propagation, so we chose Libby for that instance, uh, for that reason. So with Libby uh, and uh, Spark integration, uh, Zeppelin can now send the identity downstream, so all the way. So if John Doe logs in and uh, connects to Libby and runs the Spark job through the Libby, the job actually runs as uh, John Doe. And a benefit of all that is if your security administrator has defined policy that some business group have this particular access, other business groups have other access, all that is only possible when identity propagation is happening. So I didn't mention, but the rule of security of the AAA, all the AAA's authentication, uh, authorization, or audit, and access, uh, or access control, the second and the third A depend on the first A meaning authentication is the first step. So that's uh, why you needed uh, identity propagation to work properly before 
access control, audit, et cetera, those things can work. So for this uh, to work, you need this uh, configuration uh, uh, in your Hadoop core site.xml that basically gives the uh, permission for Livy to propagate or pro proxy user. Again, if you're using an HTTP cluster, uh, this is taken care of you. But if you're not using an HTTP cluster, if you're using some other uh, distribution, you may have to manually set this up. So the, the property I just uh, showed on the screen, the proxy user Livy group basically defines from which host and for which group is proxy ability granted. And that's what you're uh, specifying there. So now that comes, we have talked about authentication. Let's jump into uh, authorization. So authorization in Zeppelin, because Zeppelin is ultimately representing access to a backend and dealing with data, munging data, et cetera. Authorization can be at multiple different level. A security administrator or the person who installed Zeppelin, they might not be using Zeppelin, but they are just maintaining Zeppelin. In that case, they are worried about the first column and they are like, I don't want, I have multiple users uh, accessing Zeppelin. I don't want them to interfere with, e with each other. I don't want them to muck with the interpreter configuration. Whatever I've set up, they should just use it. If they have that, that type of concerns, they will be worried about who has access to uh, Ze Zeppelin UI. Only ad admin should be able to configure Zeppelin interpreters, et cetera. So all that level of access control is possible in Zeppelin UI. The other access control in Zeppelin UI that you may want to do is, as a note creator, or let's say somebody created a Zeppelin note, they may want other users to read but not execute the note. Or, uh, so that type of access control is uh, for the note level. So that's also possible. Uh, Zeppelin uh, at the note level supports owner, reader, and writer, and you can point to your LDAP group or user uh, through that mechanism. But more interestingly, authorization is at the data level as well. So if RNT propagation is configured properly, the job that you launch or whatever you're doing through Zeppelin, the identity is propagate, propagated all the way downstream. So you don't really have to do anything to control that access uh, in Zeppelin. If system has been set up properly, you will automatically get the access at the data level. So uh, that's the authorization. Uh, at the data level, uh, let's dive into uh, who can, uh, if you want to control as an admin, who can edit Zeppelin interpreters? And so the way to work that is step one is in the shiro.ini there is URL section. There you define the URL pattern that has access to the interpreter or other configuration. And you say that protection, that path should only be allowed access after authentication. That is the auth C part there. The next uh, step, uh, the next configuration element there says which roles should be granted access to. So now you're saying only somebody with admin role should be allowed access to that. Then in the shiro.ini, uh, the same file, you can define an LDAP realms roles by group, basically you're defining uh, roles to group mapping. And the role that you have defined up there in the step one, you map that role to an LDAP group. So once somebody logs in through LDAP authentication, whatever LDAP group they have access to is checked. And if they are part of the LDAP group Hadoop admins, then they are deemed to have access to admin role. And that way they can be able, they are able to go to the interpreter configuration page. So in this example, I've seen a lot of people said, yes, I've done that. But once I do that, I, uh, my users log into Zeppelin and they can't see interpreters. It's all gone. And that we have seen many, uh, many issues like that. Typically when that happens is that they may not have done the part two of this configuration properly. So a good way to lock yourself out is just do step one and not do step two. In that case, you have locked yourself and thrown the key away. So that is uh, a lot of people have done into that. And that's a very common uh, uh, issue. So, uh, then scalability and HA. So now that you have set up Zeppelin securely, you're like, what do I do next? Uh, it's all uh, working with Livy and Spark and identity is flowing all the way. My security is done. Now I want to put more users on it. I want to put 10 users on it. I want to put 20 users on it. I want to put potentially 100 users. 
I have uh, customers who are saying they want to put 800 users on it. So then it becomes a very different uh, conversation. It's different concerns that you have to worry about. Concerns like how many uh, users can you put on a given Zeppelin instance? Then in that case, my response is, what are those users going to do? Are they going to do Hive? Uh, are they going to just uh, launch some SQL queries? Are they going to launch Spark jobs? Or is it both? Because it all, all of that is input to the, the guidance you, uh, I can provide or the way you'll have to configure. So for example, uh, if you, uh, at the onset, as I mentioned, uh, Zeppelin has Zeppelin server and then interpreters that are running in separate process. So the memory and core that you can allocate to the Zeppelin server is different from the memory and core you allocate to the Spark or different interpreters. So that's uh, at that level. Because let's say you're using Zeppelin to primarily do a Spark connection or c connect to Spark and launch Spark job. So you have to worry about uh, interpreter uh, memory and core configuration. You have to worry about Zeppelin server interpreter uh, or Zeppelin server memory and core configuration. But you also have to worry about Spark executor memory and core configuration and Spark uh, performance tuning, et cetera. So that's one topic. Typically, we see for Zeppelin interpreter, uh, a good place to start is 4 to 8 GB of Zeppelin interpreter. Same for the Levy interpreter. And then memory and core for Spark, uh, it all depends on what your Spark job is trying to do. A good advice there would be send, set a boundary for, uh, set up a dynamic resource allocation, set a boundary, and scale up and down within that. And I have done a talk on this topic, uh, uh, which uh, I forgot to link here, but you can find online. And there are tons of even better resources on, on this topic available. Uh, a good place to start is the Spark tuning guide there. Now, in terms of horizontal scaling uh, uh, or HA or uh, so Zeppelin theoretically uh, supports horizontal scaling. So if you talk about HA topic in Zeppelin, you'll have to think about HA at the three level. One is Zeppelin, uh, somebody can connect to Zeppelin, and they might be connecting, uh, uh, if you have HA enabled, they might be connecting Zeppelin for, uh, through a load balancer, and uh, you, you want to share the Zeppelin configuration across different instances. So you don't have to configure the same configuration multiple times. So that's uh, configuration sharing across Zeppelin instances. There is also people are connecting to different Zeppelin instance, and they might be expecting to find the same notebook that they have on given Zeppelin instance on the other Zeppelin instance. And in that case, you have to enable uh, an external storage of Zeppelin notebook. And today, Zeppelin does support that. It's VFS, virtual file system for Zeppelin notebook storage but it doesn't support uh, very many things with that. It supports uh, S3, for example, for virtually storing the file system or where the notebooks are stored. So you can, if you're deployed on uh, S3, your instance is deployed on S3, you can have the notebook stored in S3, and whether somebody is going to notebook instance A or notebook instance B, uh, they're finding the same notebooks in both instances. But if you're deployed Zeppelin, uh, say, locally on-premise, Zeppelin doesn't yet support HDFS for virtual file system. So that's a downside. So in that case, you can uh, either do a local NFS mount so that same directory is visible across. So there are different ways to solve the problem. But going forward, Zeppelin will also support HDFS for notebook storage. So then uh, you will have another option. <coughs> So uh, if you are using a load balancer to provide HA, you, I would recommend that you enable a sticky session so the same user goes to the same notebook instance. And that way, even if you haven't uh, enabled session uh, or notebook session storage or notebook storage with the virtual file system, at least they're going to the same instance. So they are not going to call you and say, hey, my notebook is lost. I logged into Zeppelin. So that's that. So now. Uh, you have done HA as well, and now you, your users are getting very excited. They're like, yes, I'm jumping on to Spark and PySpark and uh, uh, Spark R, and how do I configure uh, these things? I want to use these things, and how do you uh, use them? So the first step of using PySpark and Spark R that often people miss is you need two different things. One is in all the nodes of your cluster where a Spark job may be launched, all those nodes need, if you're using PySpark, it needs Python binaries on all the nodes. 
So it becomes a headache, like how do you install Python binaries on all the nodes? The answer there is you can do Chef, Puppet, Anda, or any of those uh, methods. Uh, Ambari today doesn't take care of that problem. Although when you install a cluster, a HTTP cluster, Python is installed on all the nodes, but you probably don't want to depend on that Python because that Python version is used for Ambari. It's Ambari's own purpose. So that's step one if you're trying to use PySpark with, uh, uh, with Zeppelin uh, or even without Zeppelin if you're just trying to use PySpark. Same if you're trying to use Spark R, it means the R binary or the R program is installed on all the nodes of your cluster where Spark job is running. So you have to take care of that. The next thing is maybe in, in PySpark or Spark R, you, have to, you, you want to use some uh, library or a package. So the question is, how do you install it? So you can install it on all the nodes of your cluster yourself, or now with uh, HTTP 2.6 uh, in, in Spark 2.1, there is a new way in PySpark to specify a virtual ENV. So you can specify the dependency via the virtual ENV, and when the job is launched, uh, that dependency is then satisfied on the executor. So there is a blog uh, on that on Hortonworks website that details this, and, and a similar path now exists for Spark R as well. So another common problem I've seen is uh, if you set up the latest HTTP cluster 2.6, you log in uh, through Zeppelin UI, and let's say you set up a cluster as an admin, and you want to log into the Zeppelin cluster just to do a sanity testing, say everything works, and you'll see it doesn't work. And the problem is, is that the admin user is not created in HDFS because HDFS does not know whether an admin would need to log in, so that directory is not created in HDFS. So as you know, when a Spark job is run, it needs some client libraries to launch that Spark job. Those libraries are retrieved from a location within HDFS. That's why every user needs to have a home directory in HDFS, and that directory doesn't exist. So the workaround right now is to manually create that home directory for the user that's trying to connect and, uh, and make that home directory assigned to the right group. The other error I've seen is typically if somebody is using Zeppelin with Libby, uh, and, uh, and Libby, Zeppelin Libby with PySpark, you may see a 500 error uh, in the Zeppelin notebook, and that happens if you're trying to cut and paste the code across uh, your desktop to your uh, Zeppelin browser. And Zeppelin doesn't handle some uh, sort of line endings properly there. So that was a problem. It was fixed in HTTP 261 in the latest version of Zeppelin. But if you are on a previous version of HTTP, you may see this problem. And so uh, there are a few other problems as well. I mean, I guess, le and let me be candid. There are a lot of other problems, but uh, those problems can be solved. So I'm not saying it's all hunky-dory, but uh, we have problems, and we'll be honest, and we'll fix them. So uh, matplotlib doesn't work in Livy. Uh, and PySpark, uh, and that's something that uh, will be resolved soon. Uh, if you're running a job from Livy within, uh, via the Livy interpreter, the job progress is not shown in the Zeppelin UI, but you can always go to the Spark history server and see the job progress there. And Livy co uh, Zeppelin context is not available in Livy interpreter. So what are we going to do uh, in future? So uh, this is not a roadmap officially. Uh, I just want to give you a sense of where I think uh, the community is going, where I want to put my effort is. So Zeppelin needs to have a lot more visualization. It needs to have a lot more stability. Uh, it needs to have even more security. Like, for example, uh, I don't want Zeppelin to do anything with authentication. Um, my hope is this time next year, if you come to this session, you should not see any Shiro.ini. That's boring. I want to point Zeppelin to an SSO and say just Zeppelin doesn't do authentication. Whatever SSO system you have in your corporate, Zeppelin should just integrate with that. And we know in Hadoop the answer is Knox provides SSO, and the benefit is uh, whatever your security guys give you, Zeppelin will authenticate with that, and Knox supports SAML-based authentication, and that's like one of the gold standards for SSO-based authentication. So that's uh, one thing we will do with Zeppelin going forward. Zeppelin Libby connection is right now not over SSL, and that's being tested and being worked upon. 
But typically that's not an issue because this is happening inside the cluster where things are generally not uh, encrypted anyways. It's all within the uh, Kerberos and the firewall. Uh, Zeppelin doesn't have a direct integration uh, for its own uh, UI with Ranger, and that's on the roadmap. But this doesn't mean, I'm not saying that there is no Ranger authorization because the authorization is through identity is being propagated. So if the data, if John Doe logs in, if they have access to the data as defined, then they will have access to that. So I think uh, you can see there's a lot more. So the time is running out, and I, or may have run out. So uh, if you have any questions, I'll stop here. Actually, one or two questions can I take? Okay. Okay, so we can have one or two questions. Uh, just a quick one. Uh, so you mentioned the SSO integration. Does Zeppelin currently support OAuthor 2.0 as a SSO? No. Not at all? No. Okay. Thank you. It works. So the question was, does Zeppelin support Spark SQL authorization? It works because our entity is propagated. And I have a talk later today at 5.50, find my talk. There is a, a live demo of that. 